Hello and welcome What The Finances to another episode of the What The Finance podcast, where we talk to experts to help gain a greater understanding about what has happened in the world of finance, investing and markets. On today's podcast, I'm happy to welcome Andy Schechtman, who's the president of Miles Franklin uh, Precious Metals Investments. So Andy, thanks for joining the podcast today. It is great to be here, Anthony. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it and uh, happy new year to you and yours. Same to yourself. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So it, it seems as if, and I was mentioning this before, that your message is really resonating with uh, so many people across the globe, uh, talking about that, I guess, the direction of our current monetary system and actions that central banks have been making over the past five years or so. Uh, so maybe can you explain your thoughts on what has been happening behind the scenes over this period? Uh, you know, why maybe you think it's happening and what impact this will have. I know that's quite a, a bit, but yeah, just start wherever. Yeah, you know, well, it, it's, you could pick any point in time and start, you know, a lot of, a lot of what awoken me uh, was, I guess, as we talked about at the onset was, what happened in 2017 with the German Bundesbank making a strong push publicly to repatriate their gold from the New York Fed. Shortly thereafter, we saw other banks like the Dutch National Bank, the Bank of Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Austria, uh, the Czech National Bank, all of these banks doing the same thing, repatriating their gold in a period of time when no one was buying it. The following year, those same banks in 2018 bought more gold as a group than they did in the previous 60 years combined. And ironically, um, you look at what's happened this year uh, in 2022, rather, the central banks of the world have bought more gold than at any time in the last 55 years. So, you know, that trend continues here today. But the year after 2018, 2019 is when things really started to crystallize for me when the Bank of International Settlements reclassified gold as the world's only other tier one reserve asset. And it became very obvious that the repatriation and the accumulation had specifically, um, uh, I think, ties to the BIS announcement. They were obviously you know, clued in to what was coming. And so it started with getting the gold back in their possession, then accumulating it. And then we reclassified it as the only other tier one reserve asset in the world next to U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries and uh, or a high liquid uh, asset that is riskless, according to central banks. Whatever definition or name you want to call it, that's the way the central banks look at it as a riskless asset. And it became very obvious to me at that point that it would be important or play a key role in, in whatever system arises from the ashes of this old system that seemed at the point and really now seems to be nearing the end of, of its run, um, that being the US dollar, the petrodollar, the Western system. Um, and so as we you know move forward through the years, over the last few years, we've seen a lot of things that have, have happened. And in particular, 2020, I started to really notice the rise of the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative. Not enough people in this world really have any idea what that is, but it's about 150 countries from around the world that are involved in what China's attempt to, uh, to reignite or redevelop the old Silk Road, the, the, uh, the, the combination of Asia, Africa, uh, parts of, of Europe and South America. And the way China does things is very different than the way the West does. The, the West comes in and, and you know, we'll protect you. Um, we'll provide military support is typically the way they do things. China, that's not what they're doing. They're coming in and instead of protecting them, um, they are building infrastructure. They're building roads and maritime channels and bridges and, and, and railways and um, tell, teaching them how to efficiently pull th things out of the ground and economically and then providing transport services and building the infrastructure one would need or a country would need to, to become more industrialized, to enrich the middle class, to give them a better standard of living. And it's a cooperative deal uh, that, hey, you will barter, you give us part of what we help you pull out of the ground and we'll help build your infrastructure and build your middle class and build a higher standard of living. And this has really happened and permeated through many parts of the world. And, and we're seeing that accentuate itself here um, 
even today. We'll get to that that point in a minute. Um, but uh, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen an acceleration. 2021 really woke me up the day that the United States left Afghanistan in a very unharmonious way. You can say what you want about Russia and and the you know the sticky wicket they find themselves in now in regards to the Ukraine and whatnot, but they signed a joint military cooperation agreement that day with. Saudi Arabia and Nigeria. And, and I often ask people, you know, what makes the dollar the world reserve currency? And oftentimes people have no idea. And in my mind, it's the protection of the Saudi kingdom. And for that, the arrangement that OPEC agreed to sell oil globally in dollars, it has created a synthetic demand for the dollar since 1974, um, where every country on the planet earth has had to own dollars in order to buy oil through OPEC. And, and so, it really has been our protection of the Saudi kingdom that has given us the petrol reserve standard because as, as history has shown us in 1971, when we closed the gold window, went off the gold standard, went back on our promise to the world where from the end of World War II until 1971, we promised uh, the governments of the world that they could always exchange their dollars for gold at a fixed rate of $35 an ounce. And when President de Gaulle of France started to call us on that, sending warships to New York Harbor filled with dollars and demanding gold. We gave it to them, but it bled down such a precipitous portion of the gold held at the at the at the Treasury that Nixon closed the gold window. Well, it was the agreement three years later with Henry Kissinger and, and Saudi Arabia, a protection agreement where they would agree to sell their oil in, in dollars. And because the dollar had been the world reserve currency since the end of World War II, backed by gold, every country on the planet owned it anyway. It just made perfect sense for it to be the petrodollar and for that we would protect them. The fact that Russia signed this agreement the day we left Afghanistan, and there was no coincidence in that timing as we looked idiotic. Look, I I'm 52 years old. The country that I grew up in, United States, um, in every movie, in every commercial, in, in any TV show, in any anything, you understood that military never left their own servicemen and women behind, ever. That was kind of the mantra. We never leave anyone behind. And the fact that we did leave our own uh, servicemen and women behind enemy lines and the allies from the Afghan freedom fighters left behind was incredibly embarrassing to me as a patriot and I think humiliating to our administration. And there was no coincidence that they made this announcement. At that point, in my mind, it was the end of the petrol reserve status, the beginning of the end, when Saudi Arabia, the linchpin of it all, is now being protected by Russia. Well, subsequently, over the last year, things have really accelerated. And we've seen Saudi Arabia not only agree to sell their oil to China for either renminbi or the petro yuan bond, by the way, both are immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, but Nigeria did the same thing as well. And uh, now we see Saudi Arabia joining the BRICS nations. Uh, it, it has been the privilege of the United States to live beyond our, our means by the grace, good graces of our foreign creditors and the petrodollar status that I truly do believe is coming to an end. And we are, are seeing a, a coalition of countries that are, are joining together against the U.S. Uh, hegemony, against the U.S. hypocrisy. Now, you know, it's not just the U.S. It's it's you folks, too, in the U.K. and, and in in the EU um, to, to a specific point. The weaponizing of the dollar uh, it was, in my opinion, kind of the coup de gras, if you will, for countries around the world to say, you know, that's it. We, we can't trust the West anymore if we have to worry about our, fun, our, our money and our assets being sanctioned, right? Well, it gets a lot further than just sanctioning. And, and, and I think that's why you saw on Friday the Russian finance minister just reallocated their national wealth fund to up 60% of its holdings in gold from four, I mean, in um, uh, in yuan from 40 and to double it from 30 and doubling their gold holdings as well from 20% to 40. 
and completely getting rid of the British pound and the Japanese yen. Now they already hold very little, if any, in the way of dollars. So you're talking a fund that historically has been a holder of dollars, yen, euros, and pounds. They're getting rid of all of it and filling it up with, with um, uh, the, the uh, yuan and with gold. But why? Why have they done that? They have done that because the folks in the um, uh, European Union have decided to not just sanction and freeze the funds, but take those frozen funds and confiscate them. Now they just voted to use them to, to pay for, um, for the rebuilding of the Ukraine. This is making countries like China, as an example, who has sold 150 billion in bonds in the last six or seven months, every month in a row they're selling, and all the other countries like Saudi Arabia, who has now pledged to join the BRICS nations, or Turkey, who has traditionally been our ally, or Egypt, or all of these countries that are now joining the BRICS nations, saying, "Are we? Are we next? Is it going to be us?" You know, you're seeing uh, Xi Jinping certainly up the rhetoric on uh, his um, desire to reunify China with Taiwan. And, you know, what does that mean in the global scheme of things if they have to worry about the West not only joining in and from a military standpoint, God help us all, but uh, also sanctioning and freezing uh, the, the trillions of dollars worth of assets that they have littered around the United States uh, and other parts of the world. So this is a deal where the weaponizing of the dollar is something that the West really shouldn't be able to do. The administrator of the world reserve currency should not have the prerogative to say, you can use it, but you can't. If anything, it should be for worldwide opinion. And that really ushered in, I believe, the final straw, if you will, for countries around the world to look to de-dollarize. And that is, is really what we are, are seeing happen. And you know, when you realize that just in 2022, we saw Russia agree to sell their oil to China for renminbi. So whether it's renminbi or the petro yuan bond, they're both convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. We've seen Russia agree to sell their oil to India for rupee and to the United Arab Emirates for dirhams. I believe it's pronounced. I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, but it's D-I-R-H-A-M-S, dirhams, darhams. Anyways, in India and the UAE are working on setting uh settling oil and gas um in dirhams by 2023 as well um you're seeing china really push all the gulf states countries rather to settle everything on the shanghai exchanges uh for oil in in, in renminbi by 2025 and so you're moving away from the petro yuan and so i think you put it all together what you have is is a an incentivized world to build an infrastructure, whether it be the Belt Road Initiative, whether it be the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, whether it be the BRICS nations, you're talking 80% of human population joining together against the Western centuries old, Western hypocrisy, uh, dominance, um, hegemony, pick, a, pick your word, pick your adjective, um, and, Look, this is an environment where these countries in and of themselves never would have been able to even dream of doing this. When, when the West, when the United States was dealing with the Middle East way back when, when they were striking these agreements, these were poor, undeveloped nations. Now they're very wealthy, developed nations, and their aspirations and intentions are very different. different. They want respect. They want equal footing at the table. And I think they will get that with all of these countries joining together to form what will be an incredibly formidable force, not only militarily, but also from a, an economic perspective, much greater GDP than we could ever have. And a system as Zoltan Pozar, the, the Credit Suisse analyst calls, who used to work for the New York Fed, a system called Bretton Woods III, a system dominated by commodities. And you know, we've, we've heard already that the BRICS currency, which will be a reserve currency, will be pegged to a basket of commodities, not just currencies. So it's a, a new era that is being ushered in. And what has happened over the last year or two has been an acceleration, a real acceleration. 
in how fast this is happening. And it's it's really quite concerning and quite frightening as far as I'm concerned. I don't think we've seen anything yet. I think 2023 will be the year of the BRICS. And um, I guess only time will tell, but I will tell you that it's very shocking how fast the uh, the ball is spinning. What started out as in 2019, when I was talking about this, a monthly event or a semi-monthly event, now seems to be every single day there's a new piece of information that supports this linear progression of events that ultimately leads to de-dollarization and a removal of the dollar as the singular world reserve currency replaced by a, a coalition of countries where instead of uh, debt and debt instruments and a strong military backing the world reserve standard, uh, it will be 85% of human population with a much bigger military, with a much bigger economy and commodities pegged what I believe would be to a central bank digital currency. In other words, the new BRICS currency, I believe will be central bank digital currency. And they will use that technology to show the world on a distributed ledger, look, this is what is pegged by every country to the new currency. It is backed by commodities and every one of these countries has equal footing at the table. And when you look at the BRICS nations, they rotate their presidency. It's not just one country that has all the say. And so that's what will make it work. It's it's the, the hypocrisy and the hegemony and the bully that needs to be stood up against that's bringing everyone to the table. It's the pegging of commodities to the, to the new currency that will make it work. So that's where I think we are. And heading into 2023, I think it, it will only accelerate from every corner of, of, of the BRICS universe. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And you know, when, when you talk about it, it just, you start thinking about it and you're like, Oh wow, this is really getting to the point where it's going to get to the sticky end. So there's a few points I wanted to sort of unpack on a few questions I had. So uh, you mentioned that organization that uh, allocated gold as a tier one reserve asset. So sort of what, who is that organization? I guess, what does that mean? <laughs> The Bank of International Settlements, it's the central bank or central bank in Basel, Switzerland. It's the most influential bank on the planet. And so forever, gold was a tier three asset, meaning that it was only 50% was calculated on the balance sheet. And, and, and so it incentivized countries to not hold it. This is one of the reasons that the U.S. held all of the world's gold, because what they would do at the end of World War II is look, you know, Europe had been ravaged by two world wars. And so the U.S. not only was the, the dominant industrial engine, but the military superpower and the, the you know, land of the free and across the Atlantic Ocean, it was safe from the tyranny that had that Europe had been um, involved with for, for, you know, two world wars. So they, they said, how about this? You give us your gold and we'll pay you 35 bucks an ounce for it. You take that and buy our treasures. Now you'll make interest on a non-interest bearing asset. You don't have to store it. You don't have to worry about the security of it. We'll hold it. We're the, we're the allies. We're the, we're the good guys. We'll protect it. And we'll always guarantee to sell it back to you at 35 bucks an ounce. So it was a win-win for everyone. They would take the proceeds of a non-interest bearing asset and buy and give it to us, knowing they can always buy it back for what they sold it for. But in the meantime, they would earn compounding interest on reinvestment of those proceeds into, into treasuries. Well, um, a tier three asset on your balance sheet means you can only have 50% of it showing what it is. And, and the fact that it, it didn't earn any interest and the fact that it costs money to store it and protect it you know, incentivize the world to not really hold it. And quietly, the central bank or central bank, the most prominent bank on the planet, said, well, by the way, it's now the only other tier one asset on the planet. So you have US dollars and treasuries and, and gold, which according to the most powerful bank in the world is now a riskless asset. To give you an idea of what it really means is, I lend you a million dollars, I give you a check, you agree to pay it back. But in the meantime, you give me a briefcase filled with a million dollars in pounds in cash. Um, you know, do I have any risk? No. You know, if, if you're, or, or give me a million dollars, let's take the currency risk down. So you give me a million dollars in hundred dollar bills. 
Do I have any risk? No, I have a, a riskless form of collateral. Um, that's more or less what they're saying. Tier one is it's it's a an asset that has no risk according to the central banks. And so, if nothing else, it becomes very prominent in my mind in what is coming next. And when you realize that you know the BIS is no one to play with, this is a country that or a bank that has told all of the member banks that by 2025 they all must have an operational central bank digital currency. This is is you know, the very top of the food chain. So um, that's who, who made the, the admission. And that's why the banks that repatriated their gold and started buying it a year, almost two and a half years before the BIS made this announcement, they're all part of the organization. They probably said, listen, I'm going to make this change. If I were you, I would start accumulating gold and bring back what the West is holding. It wasn't just, you know, wasn't just the U.S. They also repatriated quite a bit from the Bank of England. So all of these countries are, are holding their gold. And if you, I don't know if you saw the interview recently with, I believe it was the Dutch finance minister who talked about all the gold that they hold in what they call a revaluation account. Um, gold is, is not on the balance sheet. Now, um, almost all of the gold that is held on the balance sheets of the European countries is at $35 an ounce, the way that it was forever. And they haven't ever revalued it. Furthermore, they're not allowed to um, offset it against liabilities on their balance sheet. And what he and it's interesting, they put it in a name called a revaluation account. Basically, what he was saying is that if we revalue gold to a level that uh, not only at 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 nineteen eighteen nineteen hundred dollars where it is now, but let's put it at five thousand or higher and peg it, it, it renders all of our fractured balance sheets um, solvent. And so there is a plan in store for gold. A lot of people think it will be revalued and then become a peg to a new world reserve standard. Because quite frankly, the West has screwed the pooch very badly. The West has mismanaged horribly um, the, the world reserve currency. And I think you, you know, I think you are seeing kind of a pushback against that where um, People have had enough. The world has had enough. And when we weaponized the dollar and made the decision of freezing assets and kicking the, the, the Russians out of SWIFT, if nothing else, it made a whole lot of countries say, you know what, we better find an alternative source before this happens to us. Yeah, and it's, you know, as you mentioned before about how, you know, gold, if, uh, you're, if the U.S. holds gold and they the other current countries have us dollars they then reinvest that into they could buy you know us products they could reinvest that into treasuries it's exactly the same thing that's happened with oil in uh saudi arabia it's that same thing that happened with china with all their exports you know us dollar was buying those uh, exports from china and they were reinvesting that into either you know bonds other aspects so if that were to be cut off that would have a massive impact (laughs) what they've been doing with it is sowing the seeds of our own demise they're taking that money and they're building the belt road initiative the largest infrastructure project in human history they're not buying treasures right now in fact they're selling them and they're using it to build their infrastructure to build connections and relationships around the globe that are mutually beneficial and that's what the u.s misses so yeah It's beneficial to be protected, but it's more beneficial to build, you know, it's like the old saying, give someone fish and they'll starve to death, teach them how to fish and they'll thrive. Well, that's kind of what China is doing is, yes, they're exploiting some of the, um, you know, the, the natural resources of these countries, but it's a fair trade if they're being, if they're building the infrastructure and the ability to economically harvest these um, these these assets and these resources and at the same time building the infrastructure to deliver them and sell them conveniently and economically around the world and developing mutually beneficial relationships it's a it's a plan that works but all of it against a common theme the common enemy who has ruled the world for a long time and I think these countries kind of want their say at the table. And it's a lot easier to beat the West um, financially right now than it would be in a, in a hot war with, you know, with nuclear weapons. Like you keep hearing that we are being pushed to the brink of war where 
you know, Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping is talking about readying his country for war and you know the the provocations of of Russia and 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 Biden says if Taiwan is attacked we will defend them you know you're 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 looking down the barrel of of a very very big gun and I I hope I really hope that our leaders are not that idiotic uh, that we provoke these countries into um, into escalating a, a war to which we really don't want to get involved in and so. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of reached the late stage innings, if you will, of the Western dominance in the world, and the rest of the world is pushing back and using commodities and a common mistrust of the whole Western system that is 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 bringing everyone to the table and will be the glue that makes it work. So, you know, when I started talking about this a few years ago, I had no idea at how fast it would unfold, and it seems to be unfolding day by day by day in a much more rapid progression um, than really than we've ever seen. And now, interesting enough, you know, we're talking about moving away from the petrodollar. We, we told Biden got up and told the members of the Paris Climate Accord that not only will we pay $200 billion to developing nations for the pollution that we've created, which is just idiotic, um, but that we will continue to move away from fossil fuels and combustion engines into a green environment. Well, the president of Indonesia, who has been an OPEC member since the early 1960s, just came out and said that uh, he's calling for an OPEC-style cartel for battery metals for electric vehicles. Where are all these rare earth metals mined? in Asia, the 99% of them, maybe not that much, 90% of them, the majority of all of them in the world. So, you know, I don't know how well we've thought this plan out, but I can tell you that why would OPEC and why would Saudi Arabia want anything to do with us when 85% of the world is not going green, but the portion of the world that is destroying their way of life is. And, and that's why you have to ask yourself, these idiotic moves that they are, are making, were they intended or are politicians and leaders just that stupid? What I mean by that is we're $150 trillion in debt between Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, military pensions, and our $30 trillion debt that can never be paid back as interest rates rise. So how about find a villain? And that villain is, is Putin and Xi and, and OPEC and the BRICS nations as they all dump dollars to blow up the system. Because if dollars get dumped globally, because all of a sudden OPEC says, hey, thanks for the memories, guys, but we're now joining our brothers and sisters. All 13 OPEC producing countries are on the Belt Road Initiative. Over half of them have already joined BRICS. Most of them have intended to join BRICS or said they're going to join BRICS. They will, but they will all have uh, I think treaties, whether they're in BRICS or on the Belt Road or part of the Shanghai Corporation Organization or whatever brings them to the table, they will trade with one another outside the dollar. And when OPEC says, hey, thanks for the ride. It's been great. You guys have protected us for 50 years. But just as the Royal Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia told the world the other day that China is now their most important priority for oil trade, not only this year, but for the next 50, when they come out and say arm in arm on a stage that we are now going to only sell oil for the new BRICS currency or for the Chinese renminbi or the petro yuan bond, whatever it may be, bang, just like that. The whole world says dump dollars now, sell, sell, sell as the dollars crater and find their way home in an inflationary tsunami here to the West, to the United States, the natural byproduct of that is spiked interest rates to compensate for the massive loss of purchasing power in a dollar that is inflating to zero. And so as that happens, the problem becomes that everything in this country, the three pillars of wealth that make people feel enriched, stocks, bonds, and real estate are all inversely correlated to that event. So if you wanted to blow things up, like Klaus Schwab talks of a great reset, there is no better way to do it then incentivize the world to dump dollars and to lose the petrol reserve status. And when that happens and those dollars hit our shorts, game over, in a matter of hours, markets would be trading limit down or a matter of minutes. And uh, you can throw the fourth pillar into that, and that's dollars. All four pillars of, of, of wealth disintegrate. And in, 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 in a matter of a very short period of time, 
And the worst part about it is that most of the people in the West have no clue what's coming. They have no idea that this is happening. And they have complete and total confidence in the Federal Reserve, in the government, and just that everything works out for the United States and everything works out for the United Kingdom. And, and news for you, um, you know, life is about cycles. And I would argue we are at the end of, you could call it a 100-year cycle, or you could call it a 50-year cycle, whether, you know, depending upon how you look at it. Um, we we closed the gold window in 1971. We're already living on borrowed time as a, traditionally there's about a 40 to 50 year time frame where currencies hold as world reserve. And the fact that we went off the gold standard, you know, 52 years ago, we're, we're on borrowed time. And I think it's just a matter of time before these countries join together and issue something to attempt to challenge the West. Won't be easy, won't be pretty, but when it happens, watch out. Uh, it'll be a religious experience for a lot of people who are completely and totally ill-prepared and caught off guard. Yeah, and, and you could almost link it back to, if you think about maybe 70s, 80s, the US was obviously, and the West were obviously in conflict with USSR. So basically, if they didn't help these countries, the, those countries go to USSR. So that was the real, you know, they had to go in, they had to maybe almost look at look 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 away if they were doing atrocities because for them it was a life or death situation but the last 30 years the us has really just been able to do what they want they haven't had any com competition you know if you didn't want to play their game they could just basically sanction you not fund you and then your economy will collapse but now you. yeah now china is that other option this BRICS is that other option right and and china in and of themselves you know, maybe they don't have what it takes, but you put all of China, Russia, India, South Africa, you know, you put all Brazil and all of the South American countries, Venezuela, uh, Argentina, uh, Mexico, Egypt. I mean, all of these countries, Turkey, th there's a whole list of them. I mean, there's, and the BRICS Plus, where you talk about all of the countries that are being courted into, um, into, joining the BRICS nations is, it's extraordinary. And it tells me that, look, um, the majority of the world is, is looking to, to de-dollarize and find other options to, you know, to what's going on here in the West and, and has been going on for a very long time. And I just think that most of, uh, most of the countries that, you know, really don't jive with the West are, have had it. And they are using this as a real strong rallying cry to come to the table. And so in and of themselves, not a chance, put them all together, they become very formidable. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned before how you think most traditional assets probably aren't going to do too well once this uh, blows up. You mentioned, you know, potentially speculative real estate, um, you know, equities bonds etc so how are you how do you think people would be able to protect their wealth I'm, I'm assuming that you're thinking precious metals is there anything else and then maybe why precious metals and then what else are you thinking you know there are very few things in this environment that i think will allow you to sidestep what's coming um because they're all inversely correlated to a rise in interest rates. I mean, traditionally, when things got frightening, people would buy U.S. treasuries. Well, even with the rise in interest rates right now, the U.S. Treasury on the 10-year note is 4%, with inflation at least double that. And if you were real about it and, and you look at the real CPI numbers the way they used to be calculated, probably about four times higher inflation is, which strips out food, energy, and housing since 1980. They've changed the numbers to, to, um, to fit their inflationary agenda. But, you know, where do I think it, where do I think um, it's going? I don't, I don't know where you go to be safe other than precious metals. I try to be objective. I try to poke holes in what I'm thinking. Um, there are very few places that will, will in a bear market of this magnitude, let me put it to you this way, he or she who loses least wins. And it's not about, because everyone's going to get their ass handed to them, everyone. And it's not about, about return on your money. It's about return of it. Um, 
you're going to see the housing market collapse. You're going to see the bond market collapse. You see the whole problem, really the, the whole problem, Anthony, as I see it, is that the manipulation of interest rates for all of these years has created tremendous distortions and misallocations in resources and capital um, and price discovery. And when you look at the amount of money that has been created, I mean, look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet since since 2008, when it was 800 billion after the great financial crisis to over 9 trillion here today. Um, all of that was invested in U.S. Treasuries and mortgage backed securities, which all that really did was depress interest rates and incentivize more speculation, incentivize more malinvestment and blow up asset prices to levels that are unrealistic. So there is a long, long way down. And when you talk about just how far down it is, I mean, you know, they the Fed talks about quantitative tightening, where they're going to start to sell off their balance sheet. Well, they promised us they would do 95 billion a month. They've done nothing of the sort. But if they did, at 95 billion a month, it would take nearly eight years, 7.8 years, to just shrink the Fed balance sheet back to where it was prior to the pandemic. That's still not, you. I mean, you're talking a long time if you go back to um, uh, back to what it was in 2008, at, call it 100 billion a month. So what's that? 10 months would be a year. So you're talking 90 months. 90 months it would take you to go back to where it was in 2008. So look, it, it's it's a long time any way you look at it. And um, I that's just the very bare minimum. And that's if the numbers they told us are correct. When you talk about the money that they created over the last three years, they printed more money in the last three years than the entire history of the country preceding it. So it's created massive distortions. So where do you put your money? Do you put it into real estate? when real estate got crazy high in the lowest interest rates in human history. Uh, and when rates rise, what is the real value of that property? Do you put it in stocks and bonds where the bond market is at the tail end of a 30 year bull market where when I started in this industry in 1990, interest rates were 9%. And now I watched them go all the way down to zero. And now we're climbing back up. But the problem is climbing back up in a highly inflationary environment. People say, well, inflation seems to have peaked. No, inflation hasn't begun to rear its head yet. All the money that has been pumped into the system, most of it found its way into financial assets. And when that money comes out into real goods, um, you will see price inflation explode again. I think they've tried to manage inflation, certainly by you know, bringing down the price of oil here in the States at the same time, they've bled our strategic stockpile of oil to its lowest level level in 40 years. It's all smoke and mirrors. And um, I don't think there's a safe place to put your money other than precious metals. I try to be objective. I know I sell precious metals. I know I sound like someone talking his book, but you tell me, where do you put it? Stocks at, at, at trading it. 25, 30 times price to earnings while paying virtually nothing in dividends, bonds uh, that are that are uh, paying right now a, a negative real return, substantially negative real return, even if you believe the lying CPI numbers from the Fed or from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, real estate that will invert when, when rates rise, where do you put it? You keep it in dollars when the dollar has been getting clobbered with inflation and keeping it in the bank has no safety whatsoever. And the systemic nature of everything, um, you know, and now we see a new law being passed where um, whether it be retirement accounts, um, BlackRock, money managers, uh, pension funds, they all, there was a law passed, the ERISA law, uh, ERISA law in 1974, that basically said all of these managers, pension managers, fund managers, uh, mutual funds, all of them had to invest in a way that was beneficial to the owner of, of the, the policy or of the, of the fund or to the investors in the fund, I guess I should say. And that's changed. They, the day before Thanksgiving, they, they changed that now to focus on environmental and social um, policies where you know, maybe we don't want to invest in oil and gas companies because it's not green or 
you know, maybe uh, if if this company doesn't have enough in the way of of minorities and women on the board, well, we're not going to invest with them either, even if it's to the detriment of the shareholders. They just passed this law the day before Thanksgiving. That is the Labor Department stripped out the word must and replaced it with may um, in, in the ERISA law. So things are happening that are just going to lend a tremendous instability in traditional assets. And I don't have to say much about cryptocurrencies right now after watching the carnage that has unfolded, but I do believe you'll see regulation in that industry. And I don't think we need regulation. You can look at Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff, you know, made a ton of money screwing everyone. And there was plenty of regulation in, in the equity market and the NASDAQ regulation wouldn't have stopped FTX. Um, but I think when you talk about cryptocurrencies, they are inherently risky. They are not a store of value as we have been led to believe. What they are is a speculative investment that can make you a crap load of money or, or you can lose it all. So where do you put your money? You tell me. I think, like I said, he or she who loses least wins. It's about return of your money, not return on it. And I think more and more people across the globe will realize that as things start to unwind. And this is why you have seen the London Metals Exchange in your backyard being bled down to the lowest levels in, in the six major metals that they hold, the lowest levels really in, in since they started keeping record. And what's interesting about that, it's not just gold and silver. We have seen like a 60 or 70% drawdown in, um, in metals like aluminum and zinc, a 90% drawdown in zinc off the London Metals Exchange. And it's interesting that if you look at what China has done since they started uh, uh, stockpiling commodities in 2019, get this, just read this the other day, China since 2019 currently holds 80% of global copper inventories, that's disappearing off the LME, 70% of corn, 51% of wheat, 46% of soybeans, 70% of crude oil, and over 20% of global aluminum in, aluminum inventory. And yet the LME said that over 65% of all their aluminum stockpile was drained down in 2022. Where do you think it's going? Oh, oh yeah, the bricks. They're the ones buying it all. And so this is a, a system that is being dominated by commodities. And when you look at, at the lowest level of silver ever since they started keeping records on the LME, when you look at 130 million ounces being sold out of uh, delivered off of COMEX in silver uh, in the last 18 months to the lowest registered level in, in a very, very long time. There's only 36 million ounces on the registered category of COMEX. Those are the bars available for delivery. And India will import 300 million ounces in 2022, almost 10 times what is backing the global price setting mechanism of the West. We're this close to everything blowing up where you know, in one day, a month ago, or a month and a half ago, 45% of all the kilo gold bars on COMEX were delivered in one day, just like that, gone 26 million ounces. Who's got that kind of money? Well, it's interesting when you look at that in the third quarter when all this was happening, over 400 tons of, of gold was shipped out of the West. Where did it go? It went to the East. And um, that's double that central banks, that's double the biggest third quarter on record nearly, which was 240 metric tons. And now 400 was shipped out. Uh, over 700 metric tons, I believe, for the whole year, which was the, the most since 1956. So as these nations are accumulating real assets, the people in the West are worried about gender equality and green and all of this stuff. And we're missing the global tide, the sea change um, of power. And there's an old saying, he or she who has the gold makes the rules. And I can tell you that as we send all of our gold eastward, they're buying up every single ounce they can get. And who produces all of the world's commodities? Just look at gold, the ricks and bricks, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They're the biggest producers and accumulators of gold in the world. And what happened to gold? Oh, yeah, that's right. They just reclassified it the world's only other tier one reserve asset next to what? dollars which are getting their ass handed to them. If you take a look at the pieces that are being put together uh, and the idiocy of our policies and our administration and loop it all together 
uh, it doesn't paint a very pretty picture. I don't know where the hell you put your money with any modicum of safety other than what the biggest money in the world is doing, and that is accumulating assets. There's an old saying, Anthony, and that is that assets feed you and liabilities eat you. The wealthy people in the world, they don't have massive bank accounts. Okay, they probably do, but what they have is massive amounts of assets, and it's the assets that you need in an environment where all of the uh, paper derivatives, the forms of wealth that we think make us wealthy, stocks and bonds and currency, are, are coming under tremendous fire, I think, and will here in 2023. Indeed, it's, it's a great message. So th thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, is that the message you want people to, to leave people with or is there another message? You know, I, I'd like people to feel free to reach out to us. I will tell you and everyone else out there, it's been a great sense of, a, a great source of embarrassment for me. Uh, I've been saying since August of last year that our new website is this close I sent off a letter to our um, web developers today that I'm sure they'll remember for a long time uh, that here we are in the new year and it's still not up. It's about 90%, 99% done, but um, things that need to be uh, put into place aren't. Our new website, which will have all the bells and the whistles and you'll be able to purchase online, We'll be up and running very soon for those people in the United States. We're not able, unfortunately, to ship to the UK, but we can to Canada and the US. And um, in the meantime, um, certainly send us any questions if you want an up-to-date price sheet here in the West to info at milesfranklin.com. We do have a website that doesn't list prices, but we will never be undersold. We've done this for 33 years. Anthony never had a customer complaint on um, We've done over eight billion in sales, uh, and and very proud to say that not only have we never had a customer complaint, we're one of the only major licensed and bonded companies in North America, and one of only twenty seven U.S. mint resellers in the world. Our reputation, I believe, is the finest in the industry, and we'd love the chance to work with any of your listeners over on this side of the pond. And always happy to answer questions for people in the U.K. I get those quite a bit. I wish I had uh, the propensity to be able to offer them a solution. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't. But um, unless they want to store stuff here uh, in one of our uh, seven or eight North American vaulting facilities uh, with Brinks. So other than that, I do appreciate being here. I'd love to come back on again and I wish you and yours a very happy, healthy new year. Thanks, Andy. Really appreciate it. I'll put that in the description below the website. So if they want to uh, have a look at it, I know it's online, but as you said, there's uh, big upgrades coming. So I'm sure they'll uh, keep looking at that and hopefully it comes soon. But yeah, thanks again for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.